All right, let's get this show on the road. Hello, everyone. Hope you're well. Welcome to another edition of Math 1207. Let's jump right into it. Kind of uh, ended in the middle of things. Yesterday, okay. Go. Okay. All right. So hopefully you're all doing well. Um, as you know, <laughs> hopefully I don't have to remind you, but we do have a test on Thursday. Like I said, the practice test is actually up already. It has been up on since the beginning of class yesterday. Um, we've essentially covered everything that you would need for the exam already, except maybe how to sketch hyperbolas and ellipses and the techniques that go with that. And that is at the level of, I guess, pre-calculus say it's not, it's not actually about any calculus at this point. Um, so the sketching of polar curves and the sketching of hyperbolas and ellipses isn't really a calculus thing, but it's actually important. And knowing how to sketch things like hyperbolas and ellipses is especially going to be important in the next class. But it turns out that by the time you get to the next class, students usually forget how to do that. So it's not like it's difficult, at least I don't think, and we're, we're actually going to look at that, but it, it's sort of something that uh, students need reminding of. So. Sketching is going to be very important in the future. Not polar sketching in particular, but sketching ellipses and hyperbolas in particular will be important in the future. And remembering how to sketch parabolas and stuff like that, which I'm not really going to talk about. I think people usually remember how to do things like that. Um, so yeah, so for the first uh, part of class, we're going to be focusing on sketching, essentially. And the only one that's kind of uh, weird or new I would say is the polar sketches because you're you're sketching in a different uh, coordinate system, and so that's um, that makes things a little bit more interesting. So I actually did a few examples here already uh, yesterday after we learned about polar coordinates and what they are. So I actually just want to wrap up uh, with a few more. Maybe I'll do one or two more, um, depending on if the mood strikes. Maybe I'll do one more. Uh, maybe the harder one, the one that looks, maybe I'll do E. All right. So I gave you some examples for the, uh, a simple one and a relatively difficult one, but let's actually go with uh, something that looks really crazy. You might be wondering how, how would you get a graph like E? Because um, I, I post the graphs, but let's actually look at that. So, Let's just jump right in here. So this is what we want to be able to plot. And remember, you want to think of it in a certain form. where this is your A, this is your K, this is your B, this is your C, and all of these numbers mean a particular thing uh, that will show up graphically. So the absolute value of A is your amplitude. So that's two in this case. B is your phase shift. Oh, something's coming in. Uh, B is your phase shift, which is zero in this case, which means you, you don't shift left or right horizontally. Um, C is the vertical shift, which is one in this case. And if we take two pi divided by the absolute value of K, um, which in this case is three, this gives you the period. in this case is two pi over three, right? So that basically tells you have three of these graphs within a span of two pi, right? So it's a kind of uh, talking about the frequency. 
And so uh, another thing that's often useful is the period over four, because we know that sines and cosines come in four sections. And so this helps us with the grid to actually sketch the graph. And so we would have here, it's pi over six. So we would, using all these numbers, we're going to sketch uh, the regular trig graph first. And uh, remember how that looks like. So here I'm gonna put my two pi here, I have zero. And you put in the vertical shift first, because that tells you where the baseline is and you move up and down from that. So in this case, that's one. So I'm just gonna go here, put in a one and that is the new baseline. The amplitude, as you will see here is two, which means from the baseline of one, you would go as high as two units above that and as low as two units below that. So you can go as high as three to make the, the, the noise with your mouse while you're doing it or else your line will be crooked and all over the place and it just goes off. Yeah. Um, and then you go down. So this will go as low as negative one. Okay. Now there's the grid. So we know that uh, we want uh, three periods here because it's two pi over three. So we're going to cut this into thirds. And then each third, we know we're going to have an entire graph in that. So we're going to cut that into uh, fourths. And if you want to know where these all these lines are, well, that's what the period over four tells you, right? That's why you find that. So each of these should be pi over six. So you're going to start from zero. You're going to count by pi over six. That's going to give you the location of all these grids. So the, uh, the first one would be pi over six. Then you'd have two pi over six. Then you'd have three pi over six. Then you'd have four pi over six. Then you'd have five pi, uh, five pi, uh, five pi over six. You have six pi over six, seven pi over six, uh, eight pi over six, nine pi over six, uh, ten pi over six, eleven pi over six, and then twelve pi over six would be two pi. So I'm 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 reducing here. So this is two pi over six, three pi over six, four pi over six, five pi well five pi over six, six pi over six, seven pi over six, uh, eight pi over six, nine pi over six, uh, ten pi over six, eleven pi over six. And then here you have 12 pi over six, which is your two pi. Here you obviously just have pi over six, here you have zero. Okay, so that's how you set up the grid. And so once you find the period over four, you just keep doing that until you get to two pi. Usually, I mean, there's some crazy graphs where you might have to extend beyond two pi to see them go through one full revolution, but you, you would actually know that from the angle of the trig graph. Um, but I wouldn't ask you one where you need to go beyond two pi. Um, so this is, we're in the R theta plane. So now we know that we just have to graph a cosine. So we're just going to graph the cosine. And we know how the cosine behaves. It starts at the top, then it goes to the middle, goes to the bottom, goes to the middle, goes to the top. It repeats this pattern. And then, you know, you connect the dots with a wavy, a wavy line. So it's going to be like. All right. 
So back in pre-calc, when you were learning to graph, transform graphs of sines and cosines, this is where it would end. And you're like, you pat yourself on the back and you're like, okay, we're done. Um, but for us, this is just the beginning. This is only telling us what, um, how far away from the origin we are going to be at any given time. I also want you to notice that when we hit zero is very important because that means we're actually back at the origin. That, that should actually be in between. I kind of graphed that a little bit weird. It should be in between. So for now, I'm not gonna ask you to specifically find where this is zero, although for later problems, we will have to know that. But for here, when it's just doing a sketch, I would just want you to know roughly where the locations of the zeros are. So here you'll notice a zero is somewhere between uh, pi over six and two pi over six, and then there's another one between um, pi over three and pi over two, et cetera. Okay, so from that, you go on to sketching the graph. And so I probably want this one a little bit bigger than usual. And here we're going into the XY plane. And remember, we look at the y-axis, all the numbers that show up, we take their absolute values and we draw a circle of that radius. And in this case, we only have a circle of radius one and a circle of radius three. So that's what we're going to put in here. And I think I did a thinner one, is this thinner? No, that's thicker. I'll do maybe I want it even thinner. Yeah, that'll do. All right, so I'm gonna draw a circle of radius three. Ugh. Now remember, this is going to either be faint or a broken line. If you can draw a circle in a broken line, awesome. Um, so that's circle of radius three and then a circle of radius one. So this is a three, this is a one. Awesome. Now we put in all our angles. So we're gonna put in a bunch of pi over sixes. I remember what pi over six means. It means you take pi, you divide into six pieces. So I'm gonna take each quarter and divide into three is so gonna be a, one here, two here. So you see pi from zero to pi. So this is the angle zero, this is the angle pi, and I divide that into six pieces. I can do that at the bottom. Okay. And I can actually write all these angles in. So this is you know my pi over six, my uh, two pi over six, three pi over six, four pi over six, five pi over six, six pi over six, seven pi over six, eight pi over six, uh, nine pi over six, uh, ten pi over six, eleven pi over six, and then two pi ends up back right here. So the remember, the blue is not a part of the graph. This is just going to be our guide and we're just putting in our angles. Also, what I want to do is I want to roughly find these angles where we hit a zero. So I don't particularly care about what these guys are. So let's call this like A, B, C, D, E, and F. So I know there's a zero between pi over six and pi over three. So I'm gonna just uh, split this one here. Call that A. Then between pi over three and pi over two, call that B. Then there's one between five pi over six and pi. Call that C. Then there's one between pi and seven pi over six. Call that D. Then there's one between three pi over two and five pi over three. 
Hold that E. Then there's one between five power over three and 11 power over six. Call that F. So now this is what the uh, skeleton looks like. And so I put it on my angles, I put it on my zeros, I put it on my radii. So yeah, we're done with the skeleton. Now everything is the going to be the actual graph. And this trig function is going to tell us where the graph uh, should be, how far away from the origin we are. So you'll notice here, when our angle theta is zero, our radius is three. So that's three units away in the direction of the angle zero. So we actually begin everything right here. Now notice that I move to the circle of radius one when the angle is pi over six. So by the time I'm gonna move from here to pi over six, and at that point, I am on the circle of radius one. Now, the next thing, important point we hit is A, and that's going to happen at this angle. And we hit the origin at that point. So we're zero units away from the um, origin. And that happens when we are at the angle A. So this actually comes in right here, boom. And now we're at the origin. And you continue this way. Notice that when we hit pi over three, we're at negative one. Negative one means we move in the opposite direction of pi over three. So pi over three is this direction. We need to move in the opposite direction, which is over here. And that's what the negative means. It's just a change of direction. So we're going to go um, here. And that puts us on the circle of radius one. We're actually going to go back to the origin by the time we hit the angle B. So this is going to go back here. And so now we're at B. Now from B, we're gonna to go to pi over two and we should be on the circle of radius one. So we're in here, boom, hit the circle of radius one. Then uh, moving to two pi over three, we're on the circle of radius three. So we're gonna go all the way up here, boom, we're on the circle of radius three. Moving to five pi over six, we're on the circle of radius one. So we're gonna come down here, boom, back to the circle of radius one. Then by the time we hit the angle C, we're back at zero. So we're going to be, boom, back at the origin. So now we're at C. Now pi, we should be at negative one. Now pi is in this direction, which means we should be going in this direction on the circle of radius one. Boom. And obviously we're gonna come back to zero. And that means we're now at the angle D. Then seven pi over six, we jump to the circle of radius one. Boom. Next thing is four pi over three. So we're gonna jump to the circle of radius three. Boom. Next is three pi over two, and we're on the circle of radius one. Boom. Next, we hit zero at the angle E. So E is right there. We're gonna go back to the origin. Boom. Next thing is five pi over three, and we're in the circle of radius negative one. That means five pi over three is this direction. We have to go to the opposite because the R is negative, circle of radius one, boom. Obviously we're gonna come back to the origin because that's what we did last time by the angle F. Then we move to 11 pi over six and we're on the circle of radius one. Boom. And finally, at the angle two pi, we jump back to the circle of radius three. So now we close this loop, boom. And so that's the picture.
which is amazing. So that actually looks like, uh, where were we? So now you see where that picture came from, how you have these loops inside of loops. Um, usually it happens when you have like a negative loop going back to, and, and this is something we'll talk about a little bit later. You'll notice that in the graph, there are these parts where there are very small hills that are, you, you are at the origin, you go a little bit away and come back to the origin. And then there's another case where you're at the origin, you go far away. So it's like, you can imagine that these big hills give you the big pedals and the small hills give you the small pedals. And yeah, and, and that's gonna be important a little bit later. So if, if you wanted to find, for example, which we're eventually going to find like the area of a small pedal, then you know that you can actually integrate over this interval. and things of that sort, but we, we'll get there. Right now, we just wanna know how to sketch. So there is our polar sketch. Any questions on that? Like anything we did here? So either um, sketching a polar curve yourself or and I would expect you to, of course, show the skeleton. Um, so this should be shown, but not part of the graph. Um, draw faintly or as broken lines. Um, and this is the actual polar graph. So I probably should have made it a different color from the axes, but it's too late now. <laughs> Can't go back. Okay. So um, there we go. So you draw the regular trig functions, which using this uh, information, you can get to this. That's in the R theta world, but something that looks like a, a transformed cosine function in the R theta world actually looks like a flower in the, um, the XY world. So we can figure out the graphs without having to like convert point by point is the point of this exercise. Um, so there are times when we had graphs that were sort of easy to come by because we could just uh, you know, apply our formulas and be like, oh, if I plug in the whole R squared equals X squared plus Y squared thing, this is obviously a circle. Or if I, you know, if my angle theta is at a certain angle as a constant, then it just must mean a straight line through the origin. Um, you know, here we had like R equals secant theta. We could figure that out by getting the R cosine theta in there. But every now and then you have something that's a little bit more complicated, like a, a trig function with an angle, with a double angle or a triple angle, or you have something like a transform trig function, like a three minus two sine theta. And that you're, even if you were to plug in the formulas, I think we saw that at some point. Yeah, like even if you were to plug in the formulas, you'll realize that you'll get something that you don't know how to sketch that, like forget it, like you don't know what that looks like. So when you're in that situation, that's when you do, I don't know where, where we went. Yeah, so when you're in that situation, that's when you kind of do this kind of thing. Just actually sketch in the R theta world, whatever the curve looks like, and then use that to figure out what it would look like in the X, Y plane. And I mean, try the others, you know what the answer should look like. For now, I just want to remind you um, about how to sketch other conic sections. 
So here, we're focusing on sketching. I'll tell you exactly what I want you to focus on. So I'm gonna give you a lot of formulas in this section, but you don't even have to know a lot of them as, it's, as it turns out. Um, you just need to know the general formulas of the curves. And I think everything else, just going through the act of sketching, you can figure it out. Um, except probably the foci, which I'm not going to ask you about the foci. We don't really care. Um, so there are certain properties that these graphs will have, like foci and e eccentricity and stuff like that. Like I'm not going to talk about it. I would be happy to know that you can just sketch these guys because you're going to get to a point in Calc 3 where you're starting to sketch stuff in 3D. And it turns out one of the... Um, the easiest ways to figure out how to sketch something in 3D is to sketch a bunch of 2D traces that you kind of put together into a 3D thing. And so there are going to be times where you're going to need to be like in three space and you have to kind of sketch an ellipse on one plane over here. And you have to remember, well, how do I sketch an ellipse? Or, you know, you have to sketch a hyperbola in this plane, or you have to know what the hyperbola look like, roughly where it's going to be centered. So that stuff is going to be important. And if you forget how to actually just sketch these things in an elementary way, it makes it just a lot harder when you have to figure things out in Calc 3. Um, because a lot of times to actually figure out some problems, the sketch is what's going to guide you. Um, so yeah. So here we're going to talk about conic sections, but there's some which has the the graph suggests it's when you take a cone and you slice it and you create what's called a section. Um, and so the section is just the outline of the cut. And so you can actually form a lot of things, like you can form a circle, you can form an ellipse if it's slanted. The circle is, happens when you slice it actually parallel to the base. If you slice one of the cones um, slanted to the base, you would get a ellipse. If you slice it in such a way that the slice goes through the opening, um, that's what gives you a parabola. And if you slice it vertically, such that you go on two of the corners of the cone, that's what gives you a hyperbola. So you can get all these guys. You also can get guys that are not curves, but like points or straight lines. These are called degenerate um, conic sections. We're not really gonna care about those. Um, so you'll know what those would look like. So the graph of this one is something like X squared equals Y squared would give you a graph like this. Um, but conic sections, generally, they have like these parabolic formulas in it. You'll see a lot of x squares and y squares and things of that sort. Um, but yeah, let's actually uh, go through that. So I put a YouTube video here, which is, um, if you have time, maybe you can do it after Thursday. Uh, which is just, it talks about some of the applications of conic sections, which I think it was a pretty cool thing to know, because I think in, even in the next class and in pre-calc, like you'd learn about conic sections and know how to draw them. Whoop-de-doo, you know how to draw an ellipse, but like, why would you even care? <laughs> so um, there are some applications of conic sections here. Like how does knowing um, what a hyperbola is uh, help us in the real world? So, so there are some applications here. That's it's, I think it was presented really nicely. Anyway, let's move on. So there are a bunch of things that we can write with general formulas. Um, parabola, I'm not really gonna ask you about that. So you can essentially just kind of forget this. Um, red strikeouts, ignore. Like, I'm not gonna ask you about props, let's move on. So one thing I am gonna ask you about are ellipses. So these are like those elongated circles, right? So it's like a circle where one axis is stretched. Now we're usually going to care about if they're stretched vertically or horizontally. Though you can stretch a circle in a different direction, that actually makes things a lot more complicated. And that is sort of what the rotation of axes thing that I have down here is about, but I also, going to ask you to ignore that. Don't worry about it. Um, because things get a lot more complicated if you're not stretching like strictly horizontally or vertically. But um, the ellipse, when we look at how we're going to look at it, we're just talking about a circle that's stretched either horizontally or vertically. I am not going to have you care about what the foci are. Right. 
So this is just like how you can construct them. So there are two like two eyes right here that are called the foci. And it comes from like how you can actually construct uh, an ellipse. Like if you put down two pins and then you connect them with a loose string, then you take a pencil and you make the string taut as much as possible. And then you move your pencil, keeping it taut around those two poles the whole time. That will actually sketch out an ellipse, right? In a very similar way, how you can sketch out a circle is to just put a pole down, a string, use your pencil, stretch that string as far as possible, and then go around the pole. That that string works as like your radius, and it's always going to be the same distance from the pole, and you can get a circle. You can get an ellipse in a kind of similar way, but you have two of these poles. These are called the foci, right? One pole is called the focus. And pole is probably a bad word to use. That that has a meaning in complex analysis, but whatever. I, I just think you guys, you guys know what I'm talking about. So we have that, right? So I'm going to need you to know how to sketch these. Um, now, uh, what I need you to know is what the equation looks like. So this you need to know. Okay. So if you have like an X minus a number, so H, K, A, and B are numbers here. If you have X minus a number squared over a number squared plus Y minus a number squared over a number squared equals one, that gives you the equation of a hyperbola, uh, an ellipse. Okay. Now, as you see here, uh, we're assuming that our A is greater than B. So this sort of tells you if the bigger square is under the Y, it stretches vertically, as opposed to if the bigger square is under the X, it will stretch horizontally. So whoever has the bigger number in their denominator, you're stretched in that direction. And we'll actually talk about um, what that means. We'll see that in a little bit. Um, so there's also hyperbola. It's another kind of conic section. Um, and remember, this is where we had those hyperbolic trig functions coming from. Uh, I do not expect you to know the general formula for the asymptotes. So you can ignore that or the foci. The vertices, I don't expect you to know the general formula for, but the vertices are the guys right here, like these points here, the extreme points. Those are the vertices. Like I, do, I don't expect you to memorize the formula for where they are because it's going to be obvious where they are based on how we're gonna sketch it. Um, and you'll see here faintly that there's these this rectangle in the middle and this X. I'm gonna show you how to get those rectangles and those Xs. And then this point is going to be obvious what that point has to be. It's kind of a mid, it's the midpoint between um, each side. And I'll show you how to sketch that. But right now, um, the important thing is the general formula. What I want you to recognize is that this is very similar to an ellipse, except the middle sign is a negative sign. So when one of the squares is negative and the other is positive, this is what gives you a hyperbola. If both are positive, you're adding two squares of this form equals one, that gives you an ellipse. If one of them is negative, that gives you a hyperbola. That's the idea. Now, if the Y square is the one that's negative, that means your hyperbola opens in the x direction. So it opens towards the positive square. If your x is negative, it'll open towards the y. Right? So these are just some things I expect you to know. Um, so these formulas, just what the general formula looks like and how it translates to the graph is essentially what uh, we need to remember. And I wrote down everything in words here. And we're going to do some examples. And you're going to see it's not going to be like writing down the forms and seeing everything all at once. It might look complicated and stressful, but it's it's not bad. And there's a circle. I'm not going to ask you to draw a circle. I expect you to recognize when something is a circle, that that's the general formula for a circle. Um, but like me asking you to draw a circle, I'm not really going to do that directly. Um, so something like that you need to know. So uh, my focus here is to remind you how to sketch uh, ellipses and hyperbolas, because that's something that students usually forget over time how to sketch. So I kind of want to remind you how to sketch these. Um, 
And so these are essentially the steps. So let me kind of illustrate the steps to you while we're doing this here. So say you wanted to sketch this sort of thing. Um, X minus H squared over A squared plus Y minus K squared over B squared equals one. What do you do? The first thing you do is you identify the center, which is the H comma K. So you'll actually just see these numbers. You pick them out, H comma K, right? So let's say, and I, I'm just going to make something arbitrary here. So let's say it's right here. That's your H comma K. That's the first thing you're going to do. Okay. Now, what else do you do? Okay. Now, the next thing is you're going to figure out how to get that rectangle in play. So the next thing you're going to do is you're going to, from the center, you're going to move according to the A's and B's. Now, the A is under the X. So this means the A tells you how far to move in the X direction. So whatever is under the X, that's A, you're going to move left and right by A. So you're going to move out here A units, and you're going to move out here A units. Then whatever is in the Y, which is the B under the Y, that tells you how to move vertically. So you're going to move, say, B units and B units. So that has length B. This has length B. Um, let me exaggerate the A for more effect. So the A, let's say the A is larger, right? Significantly larger, you get that. Okay, so this, when you move up and down and left and right by the A of the B, this tells you how to actually construct the rectangle. So the rectangle is going to be like, uh, And that's it. Now from here, you actually know what the vertices are. The vertices are going to occur where these lines meet that rectangle. They extend directly to the rectangle that holds the ellipse in it. And now to sketch the ellipse, you literally just connect the four outer dots, the four dots along the rectangle, kind of a curve shape. So you go like, and that gives you the ellipse. Are we okay with the process or do we get what I did? So yeah, you identify the center, you move left and right by the A, A here being the guy that's under the X, you move up and down by the B and notice that the guy under the X and the, the Y, they're, they're squared numbers. So if they're written with the square visible, you know you just take the base. If they're written with the square not visible, you know you have to take the square root. So if you have like a, um, so this, like for this example, this might be what something like, oh, X minus five squared over four plus Y minus one squared equals one might look like. So let's say this is one on the Y, this is five on the x and so in this case your a oh, let's make this a little bit let's make this a little bit i mean it's a little bit bigger so in this case your a would actually be three and your b would actually be one right because you have to write them as squares to know what those numbers are so it's, it should be obvious that this here is really just x minus five squared over three squared plus y minus one squared over one squared. So you move three from left to right in the x direction, you move one up and down in the y direction, and you start from the point five comma one, okay? That allows you to create this box where the lines extend to hit the box would be the vertices. So here, you, do, you don't really have to even memorize that formula. You can kind of know 
that this is automatically going to be, well, if I start at five and I move three units that way, then the X coordinate for this must be a two, right? The Y coordinate is gonna be a one. So I know that vert vertex is gonna be two comma one. Like I didn't have to, I didn't need a formula to tell me that. Um, and here, if I start at a five and move to the right three, then this X coordinate must be an eight. And obviously since I'm moving horizontal, the Y is still one. So that's eight comma one, right? Whereas this coordinate here, the X is always five on the vertical line. But what about the horizontal? Well, if I start at one and move up one, that should be at two. And if I start at uh, one and move down one, well, technically this should be at zero. Let me make it. We'll fix it in editing. So let's make this a two. Going up one will be three, going down will be a one. And so I would make this a two because I don't want to have to redraw my graph. Okay, cool. So that's what that ellipse would look like. I can identify, I can sketch it and I can know where all the vertices are. So the guys here, these are called the major vertices. And usually if they say just vertices, they mean the major one. Um, but these can be called the minor vertices here. Now, the only other difficulty that you might encounter here is that you're not given the equation in this form. It's possible that you're given the equation with everything spread out. And then what you would do is you kind of use complete to, completing the square to get it in this form, right? So that's the like the worst case scenario is that you have to do some completing the square before you start doing this graph. But once you can actually write it in the general form that's in the table, um, getting the picture shouldn't be too bad. That's generally how you go about it. And the difference is if it's vertically stretched, the B is just going to be bigger than the A. So it's not something you have to remember, oh, what is, is the A and the B, right? The Whichever bigger one, that's the one that's going to stretch. So that is, um, this is a general rule, how you'd sketch an ellipse. Now, how you'd sketch a hyperbola, which this one actually has two forms because it's possible that the X is the negative one or the Y is the negative one. In here, I'm putting the A as the denominator of the X. Um, but um, it starts out very similar to how you would sketch a, an ellipse. So you, you'd go as far as getting the box, but you actually need to do something further. So general steps are here. And the thing is the hyperbola has asymptotes. So I'm gonna explain what's going on in the steps here as I'm doing it, but you can read the steps later if you want. So here's how you'd actually go about sketching a hyperbola. So it's not a very good straight line, is it? So let's say we're here. So once again, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to identify the center h comma k. And once again, you're going to move to the left and right uh, by a, and you're going to move up and down by b. And once again, you're going to get a box. Now, there's an additional step here. See, a hyperbola has these asymptotes, right? There are these straight lines here that the curve approaches as you're going off to infinity, right? Now, how you actually get those, it's actually going through the diagonals of the box. So once you have the box, you just draw the diagonals and you just extend these diagonals off to infinity. Now, these technically aren't a part of the graph, but uh, they, def they are the asymptotes. So here, you would just extend that, extend that, extend that, extend that, right? So that's how you get the asymptotes. Now, I mentioned that you don't need to memorize the formulas for the asymptotes, but let's say if push comes to shove, like, like it's not something I would ask very commonly, but 
push comes to shove, you need to figure it out. It's easy. You, you would know how to find this point or that point and just find the equilibrium of the line going through that point. It's, it's really not going to be a difficult thing to do. So I wouldn't necessarily tell you to memorize it. Now, if the, now this is the first set of things you do, whether you're in situation one or situation two, the difference is um, which direction you open up in. So let's say we're in situation one. Uh, so uh, example sketch of type one. Now type one, this is when the X is positive. And this means you open towards the X axis. So this means that you are east-west opening. So what that would mean is that your vertices are actually here on the X. When the X is positive, your vertices are on the X. And then you would actually open towards the asymptotes. Similarly over here. And so now that would be the sketch of the hyperbola. These these two sides should kind of look the same. Um, in, in the event that, and here I can literally just copy this. Um, let's be this an example of type two. Uh, let's see, let's get rid of these. Okay. Now, if you're in situation two, which is when the y is the positive square and the x is the negative square, this means you open in the y direction. So you'd go through the whole thing, you'd draw the box, you'd put in the diagonals, you'd extend the diagonals off to infinity. And then in this case, what you do instead is you actually would open up or down as opposed to left or right, which they might call north, north south opening. So your vertices would be on the Y in that case. And you'd open this way. And you're asymptotic to these um, lines here. They're actually the asymptotes. And that's pretty much it. So, I mean, at this point, finally, we've covered everything you're going to be tested on in, in the second test. Um, I wanted to get to this point yesterday, but. Um, but it's not so bad. Like, there's no calculus here. Like, this is it. Just like, know how to construct the sketch of a hyperbola. Know how to construct the sketch of an ellipse. That's all I need you to know from this section. Um, know how to sketch and identify sketches of uh, polar curves. Like, I think I gave you some both like matching problems and maybe one where you have to sketch as well. It wouldn't be like this. Like, this is too hard to sketch for a test. Um, but like if you if I like being able to sketch one of these simpler ones, like a four leaf clover or um, like one of these things, which I'm not I don't remember what this is called, but you can also sketch a cardioid, which looks like a heart, a heart shape. Um, so simple things like that, you should be able to sketch. And we'll actually, I think, even sketch some more later. But this is this is where we are. Now, I do have some examples here that we can go through um, that might show you more of the sort of the challenges that could come with problems like this. But again, it's not calculus. It's really just algebra and knowing how to simplify to get to the point where you can actually answer a problem. So did I redo these? Yes. 
So let's say you have a, a problem like this, right? Identify the conic section, state at center, um, and sketch. So I put in the answers here because I wasn't sure if I was going to do it in class, but um, we are making good time. So I'm just going to continue. Right. So you see this, it's all spread out. But you, you kind of notice that you have like a, a positive x squared and a positive y squared, and their coefficients are different. Now, if the coefficients were the same, it would be a circle. The fact that the coefficients are different means that it will be either an ellipse or a hyperbola. We know that this is going to be an ellipse because they're both have the same sign. The squares are either both positive or they're both negative. So I kind of know ahead of time this is going to be an ellipse, right? Um, I didn't. I can't identify its center in this form though. So I first have to put it in the form of an ellipse. And so for doing that, that's where you would uh, complete the square would come in. So we have nine x squared plus sixteen y squared minus eighteen x plus sixty four y equals seventy one. Now what we would do the first thing is to kind of group the x's and y's together. Constants on one side, on the other side, you group the x's and y's together, and you're actually going to complete the square. Uh, now, remember to complete the square, you need the coefficient of x to be one. So we'd factor that out. Sixteen goes into that four times, I think. And then we're going to complete the square inside these parentheses. So remember how we complete the square. You're going to add and subtract a convenient term. So so we're going to add and subtract one half the coefficient of x squared. And then we're going to add and subtract one half the coefficient of x squared. Now, what's the first three terms will always be a complete square. It's going to be the x plus the guy in the middle, all squared. So this actually becomes x minus one, all squared. And then you have this negative one left over. There's a nine here, 16 here. This becomes y minus two all squared. And then you have a four left over. Okay. Now uh, we can expand. We have nine x minus one squared minus nine plus 16 y minus two squared minus 64 equals 71. So this would be nine times x minus one squared plus 16 y minus two squared equals, we're gonna have 71 plus 64 plus nine. So 71 plus nine is 80, 80 plus 64, it's gonna be 144. Now remember how the general formula for an ellipse is, the constant on the right needs to be a one, right? So that's that's where knowing what's in the box is going to be important. You know that the constant on the, the other side needs to be a one, right? That is true for both the ellipse and the hyperbola. The only difference in the hyperbola is that one of these guys, the squares are negative. So what I would want to do here is I want to divide both sides by 144. And can continue. So 144, what is that? Um, this is sort of, 144 is 12 times 12. So that's actually going to be like, uh, I can think of this as three times four times 12.
or let me think of it another way. Three times four times three times four. Three times four times three times four. 12 times 12. Um, the nice thing about that is that the nine will cancel two of these threes, leaving me with a 16 over here. Plus, yeah, so this is three times four times three times four. Um, so the 16 will cancel two of those fours, leave me with a nine under here. And so that is our ellipse. So here I can see that this is an ellipse with center one comma two. And then I can actually sketch that now because we now know how to sketch that. So I'm gonna thing here. Over here, I made this one. You got two, one comma two, that is the center. Now for the X, notice that underneath the X, there's a 16, 16 is four squared. This tells me I'm gonna move four units in either direction in the X. So I would move across here by four. That will actually put me at minus three. I'll move forward here by four that would actually put me at five. Then for the Y, it's three units up and down. So I would actually go up by three. This is actually more space. I would go up by three, down by three. So this would move me up to like a five. This would move me down to like a negative one. And this here will be like the box. And I know that these guys are the vertices. And so this is going to be the ellipse. So that's how you'd identify and sketch. And that's like the worst case scenario. If it's not given in a nice form at first, what you would do is you'd complete the square and um, get it into the right form. And then you can sketch it. I'm going to skip this try on your own. I might do this one. So this is a hyperbola. And I can see that right away because the X and Y have the, the square, the X squared and the Y squared have different signs. Notice here, my X squared is negative and my Y squared is uh, positive. I don't know which direction it's going to be open in because it depends on getting that positive one on the other side, which I might have to negate both sides to get that to happen. Um, but I do know it's a hyperbola. And then we have this. And so we're, we're going to be done there. So let's just actually wrap up this section, which is this one. So I could ask you to do something like, just identify this and sketch it. I could also ask you to something like, oh, identify this curve and select which of the following sketches corresponds to the curve or something like that. So I might give you a bunch of pictures of like ellipses and hyperbolas, and then you have to click the right one. Um, so those are all sorts of options. Um, so I wrote, I don't remember which problem I actually put on the actual test, but I'm just giving you an examples of the kinds of things that I would ask 
um because i wrote up a bunch of stuff and some of them i put on the final some of them i put on the test some of them I put out a practice test i don't remember where i put who i put where because uh, I, I wrote those like a week ago or so um but yeah so let's actually figure this one out so uh we have to figure this out so we have to start doing our thing remember we're going to uh group the x's and the y's you know i should do the x first just because it's minus x squared minus 2x plus 4y squared minus 24y equals minus 31. Factor out a, a negative 1. Factor out a 4. So what I'm going to do here is this is x squared plus 2x plus 1 squared minus 1 squared y squared minus 6y plus 3 squared minus 3 squared. So this is just x plus 1 all squared minus 1. This is y. Is technically a negative thing here. Y minus three all squared minus nine. So this is going to be a minus X plus one all squared. And this is going to be a plus one plus four Y minus three all squared uh, minus 36. is minus x plus 1 squared plus 4y minus 3 squared equals minus 31. I'm going to add the 36, and I'm going to subtract a 1. So that gives me 4. Then I want to divide both sides by 4. So I follow everyone agree with me so far. Okay, so that's a hyperbola. Um, so now we can go and we can start to sketch what that looks like. The center is y equals three, x is minus one. So, okay, so maybe this is gonna be over to the side a little bit. So this guy here is a hyperbola. With center minus one comma three. So I'm going to go in, uh, say minus one comma three. That's where I start. Now in the x direction, I'm gonna move two units to the left and to the right. Got one, uh, yeah, I use that color. Two units. So this is actually gonna bring me past here. That's gonna bring me up to the one. Then I go two units that way. And that's going to bring me to minus three. Then for the y, I'm going to move one unit up and down. So it's one up, one down. So this is going to bring me down to two. And this is going to bring me up to four. This is our box. Then I can create the asymptotes. So 
to street diagonal. And now, based on who is positive, tells you whether it opens up and down or left and right. And here, the Y is positive, so it's going to open up and down. So the vertices are going to be here. Tends to go up there. Yeah, so that's what that problem would look like. Any questions on any of this? Okay. So uh, we will uh, take a break right here. See you guys in five minutes and we will continue. But for now, you know everything you will need to know for the test. Um, we haven't covered everything you need to know for the homework, but for the test, we are up to everything. Um, yeah, but uh, now we are going to go back into some calculus stuff. Rotation of axes, you can't ignore that. This is like when you have like uh, ellipses that are like slanted at a weird angle. Um, but we're gonna go back to calculus. We're gonna go and talk about doing calculus in polar coordinates, like uh, how do we find slopes and, and that sort of stuff. Um, but when we get back. So all right, we'll take a break here. See you guys in a little bit. All right, so we are back. Let's actually continue. So um, turns out that as I was saying earlier, well, last class, um, when we go into polar coordinates, there were certain equations that came into play, x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta. Um, and theta is just this angle. r is just something that, uh, r is the distance you measure from the origin. And it turns out that R often, and that was the case uh, with some of these guys, R can be expressed as a function of theta. And generally that would be some way that you're looking at R, right? Like a polar equation, you can always think of R as a function of theta. So in other words, when we say, you know, X equals R cosine theta and Y equals R sine theta, you can actually look at these as functions of theta. And the angle theta is doing its thing. Maybe it's going between two angles A and B. Maybe it's from going from negative infinity to infinity. It doesn't matter. But the idea is you can think of your X and Y as separate functions of theta. And therefore, you can think of theta as a parameter. And you can now think of the polar coordinate system as a system that was built by a specific set of parametric equations in the same way that um, trigonometry was built by a set of parametric equations. The whole idea of the polar coordinate system was pretty much us taking this set of equations and building a universe based on that set of equations. Like if we think of X as this and Y as this, what would it mean to sketch a curve? What would it mean to locate a point? What would it mean to do blah, 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 right? So we can actually describe uh, polar coordinates in general as like a system of parametric equations. And so with that uh, being said, when it comes to doing the calculus with polar coordinates, we can actually piggyback off the calculus that we did with parametric equations. So we actually saw that with a parametric equation, when you wanted to find like dy dx, what you did was the, the y prime over the x prime, right? So you take the derivative of the y with respect to t and divide by the derivative of the x with respect to t. Now, this is just like, uh, in the case of polar coordinates, your t is like theta. So dy dx is really dy d theta divided by dx d theta, 
Now, um, this formula here looks uh, a little bit complicated, but that's just because we're thinking of our R as a function of theta. And so we can do the product rule, right? So it's like, if you think of say, y equals r cosine theta uh, and you're thinking of your r as a function of theta then this means your dy d theta you would just go through and you would do the um you would do the product rule right so you would differentiate the is this sine squared no i just it just spazzed out. That's not cosine. Why is it sine? So you just do the product rule. So you leave the F, differentiate the sine, you get cosine, plus you differentiate the F and you leave the sine. Right? And that is what gives you the numerator here. So the numerator is just fleshing it out. Um, but essentially, what you're going to do is you're going to think of Y as R sine theta. You're going to plug in the uh, function for r. Think of x as r cosine theta. You're going to plug in the function for theta. Then you can just differentiate these with respect to theta. You take that ratio, and that's like your dy dx. And very similarly, we can actually express the second derivative in this way. Okay. So theoretically, there's nothing much to talk about other than just saying, oh, parametric uh, polar coordinates just work as parametric equate a parametric system as a function of theta using this as the parametric equations. And then you can really build out your calculus based on that. So um, nothing much else to say, but let's just try an example to see how this will work out. Um, so let's say here's an example. We're looking at the function r equals sine theta, which we know we now know is like a circle. In fact, we can uh, we can know that this circle is going this we can know that it's going to be r squared equals r sine theta. So this is like x squared plus y squared equals x. So it's going to be equals y. So it's going to look like x squared plus y minus one half squared equals one half squared. Right, so we actually know what this circle looks like, right? It's like a circle like this, where the center is at one half, this would be at one, this would be at zero. The put here, this would go to a minus a half. Out here, this would go to a half. So I actually know that, but you don't have to know that, at least not for this, like I didn't ask you to sketch it. But um, this might help explain some things later on. So we know that this is a circle. It falls into one of the general forms of a circle that we looked at, um, I want to say yesterday, yeah. Like anything that looks like this is a circle. And I told you like generally, these would be a circle of this form. Right. So in this case, your A was zero and your B was one. And so we get that that's a circle. Right. Now, you, like I said, you don't need to memorize that because as you can see, I just did it on the spot and it, it wasn't too much trouble. Um, but yeah, let's actually go through and do some calculus here. Let's find where does this curve has horizontal tangent lines? Where does it have vertical tangent lines? And what is the slope on, of the curve when theta equals pi over three? So let's just do that. A. So uh, for both of these, we need to know the derivative, right? Oh, yeah, we need to know. dy dx. Now dy dx, we know. is just going to be y prime with respect to theta divided by x prime with respect to theta. In other words, this is going to be d d theta of r sine theta divided by d d theta 
of r cosine theta. Right. Now I'm not even looking at the general form that I gave you, the general form I gave you above. I'm just actually going to plug them in. So here it's going to be r we saw was the sine function. So this is d d theta of sine squared theta. And this is d d theta of sine theta cosine theta. So that's going to be 2 sine theta cosine theta. And the denominator, I can do it like uh, differentiate the sine, leave the cosine, I get cosine squared theta. And if I leave the sine, differentiate the cosine, I would get minus sine squared theta. Notice that these are trig identities. So this is sine two theta over cosine two theta. In other words, the derivative is given by 10 two theta. Okay, so there is a general formula here, but I mean, I, I, I didn't mark it with an X because technically you don't have to memorize it. Just actually plug in the R into the R cosine theta and R sine theta, and then just differentiate the top, differentiate the bottom. Um, and that brings you to the derivative. So now we can actually start to answer uh, the question. So one, we want to find out where are the horizontal tangent lines? So we know where these actually occur. This is when um, dy d theta equals zero, but your dx d theta is not zero. So dy d theta, that's just the, the numerator. So that just means uh, sine. So that's the equation that I have to solve. Um, to find where the uh, tangent lines are horizontal. And so we know, and so this is the thing that you have to memorize for this thing, which I kind of mentioned before. You need to remember all your trig stuff from pre-calc. So you should know by heart where the sine function hits zero. The sine function hits zero at every multiple of pi. Sine of n pi is always zero. Um, so this means that two theta needs to be n times pi, where n is any integer. So in other words, your theta needs to be n pi over two. So n is any integer. Okay. And so this would be, just to give you some examples here. If n is zero, that would work, um, but I can put in n is plus or minus one, so that'd be plus or minus pi over two. If n is two, that's plus or minus pi. If n is three, plus or minus three pi over two, et cetera. It'll happen uh, infinitely often, okay? So that's going to be your theta. So that's the theta needed to get uh, horizontal tangent lines. And notice that this is not going to be the same thetas that would make the denominator zero. We know that sine and cosine aren't zero at the same time. The denominator is a cosine, right? So, so I would write note cosine two theta not equal to zero at these values. We're going to find where cosine two theta equals zero because we need that for the vertical tangent line part. But just the understanding that sine and cosine don't hit zero at the same time. One is always like a pi over two step behind the other. Um, so we know they won't hit zero at the same time. So we're actually cool here. Um, but what we can do now is the problem asks us for find the points where the curve is horizontal, has horizontal tangent lines. So we want to find the xy coordinates. So we know that. Uh, x is r cosine theta, which in this case is sine squared theta, because our r was sine. 
And so now we want to evaluate this at your theta equals n pi over two. So you'd have sine squared of n pi over two. And um, it's not sine squared. I was wrong with me today. I keep messing up the sines and the cosines. It's sine times cosine. That's going to be evaluated at theta as n pi over 2. Um, probably I want to think of this as 1 half sine 2 theta. So then I don't have to worry about the over 2. So this just looks like 1 half sine of n pi. So that's actually always zero. Okay, now let's look at what the y is doing. Y is r sine theta. This guy is your sine squared. And I want to evaluate that at n pi over two. So this is your sine squared, n pi over two. So now you can actually plug in some values to see where it would occur. So um, zero is what you would get if n equals zero. If you plug in n equals one, you would get uh, one because sine of pi over two is one and you're squaring it. If you plug in n equals two, you would get zero. If you plug in n equals three, sine of three pi over two is negative one, but you're squaring it, so you're getting positive one. And notice that this pattern is going to repeat. So there are only two values, two y values for that, one x value for that. So that gives you all the points. X can be zero, and it always has to be zero, but the y can either be zero, zero, or the y can be one. So those are the two points. And of course, this makes sense. Like you can check that this, you can see that this makes sense. Since we know what the curve looks like, it's like this circle right here. And it goes up to one, down to zero. And the horizontal tangent lines, occur at these points at zero comma zero and at zero comma one. So we, we could actually figure that out. Like by knowing the, we know the picture so we can check our answers very easily. Sometimes the picture is going to be crazy, right? Like we've seen an example where the picture, like you don't wanna to have to sketch this out before knowing what the slope is at, or where the horizontal tangent lines are. We wouldn't wanna to have to do that. But it's just nice that we have a nice curve here that we can verify that our answers make sense. In fact, you can see where there's going to be vertical tangent lines as well. It has to be at the endpoints over here. Um, and so we'd expect the answer to be uh, minus a half comma a half and a half comma a half. And let's actually see if the math actually bears that out. But yeah, that's how we'd find a horizontal tangent line. Um, two for vertical tangents. This means your dx d theta equals zero. Your dy d theta not equal to zero. Remember in the case where both of them are zero, we just uh, take the limit as we approach the value that makes them zero and do like a L'Hopital's rule kind of thing. Um, and that will tell you what the, what the derivative is doing. But for now, the, there's no interaction between these two. The denominator and the numerator aren't zero at the same time because the numerator is a sine of an angle and the denominator is the cosine of that same angle. They're never gonna hit zero at the same time. So we don't really have to worry about it. So for here, how did I write it? This means that cosine of two theta equals zero. 
Now we need to remember where does cosine hit zero? We would remember that cosine hit zero for all odd multiples of pi over two, right? So one pi over two, three pi over two, five pi over two, seven pi over two, and all the, the negatives of those minus one pi over two, minus three pi over two, et cetera. Right. So the cosine will hit it. Someone's trying to get in here. The cosine hits zero at all odd multiples of pi over two. So this means that the angle must be um, n pi over two, where n is an odd integer. So this means our theta needs to look like n pi over four, n odd. So now we can go and plug in um, the x. We know it's r cosine theta. This is going to be uh, sine theta cosine theta evaluated at theta equals n pi over 4 n odd, which is 1 half sine 2 theta evaluated at theta is n pi over 4 n odd. So if I plug that in, I get sine of n pi over two. Um, n odd. Right, and that that will be either plus or minus one. Right, so like sine of pi over two is plus one, three pi over two is negative one, five pi over two is plus one, seven pi over two is negative one. So it's either going to be plus or minus one for the x coordinate. Uh, well, multiply by a half. Which actually makes sense uh, based on our picture. If you look at the y, we know this is our sine theta. This means we're looking at sine squared theta evaluated at um, theta equals n pi over 2, n pi over 4, n odd. So here we have sine squared of n pi over 4. But n has to be odd. So this is going to look like, like pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, etc. And the only thing that would change there is the signs because you're using reference angles. But we're squaring, so it's not going to matter. So this is either going to be plus or minus rad 2 over 2 squared. Right, which is like 1 over rad 2. So that's going to be plus or minus 1 half. But well, positive a half. Actually, it's always going to be positive a half because we're squaring it. And so now, yeah, so that's the points for, so the points look like x, y equals, what did I write here? Oh, I just wrote points. So your x can be plus or minus a half, but your y is always a half. So those are the values. And again, you can see that makes sense. Because if you look at this circle, this is at the level of a half, that's at the level one. This would be um, one half comma one half. This would be minus one half comma one half. And that is precisely where I said the vertical tangent lines are. And that is uh, true. Okay. So um, the calculus conceptually speaking is the same as with parametric equations. So that's not going to change. But as you can see, the only difference is here, you have to really remember your trig and remember the values at special angles, that sort of thing.
And for part B, what is the slope when theta is pi over three? Well, we actually know what the slope is. Slope at theta equals pi over three. Well, we know dy dx is 10 to theta. So this means uh, at theta equals pi over three, the slope equals tangent of two pi over three. So two pi over three is in the second quadrant, all students take calculus, all students take crack. Okay, so in the second quadrant, the tangent is gonna be negative and it will give you the same value as sine of pi over three divided by cosine of pi over three. Sine of pi over three is rad three over two, cosine of pi over three is a half. So that's minus rad three. Um, yeah, and that, that would be the answer. Does this make sense? I don't know, makes sense. And in chat this one, we can check by checking the coordinate and just seeing if it sort of makes sense on the graph. So the X is, we saw that that was one half sine two theta. So this means the X needs to be one half sine of two pi over three. So that's going to be a one half times rad three over two, so rad three over four. Okay, so the X is gonna be positive. The Y is actually sine squared theta in this case. So the Y coordinate would be sine of pi over three squared. So sine of pi over three is rad three over two, but you square that, so you just get three fourths. And so if we look at this picture, we know that this goes down to one half. This goes down to negative one half. This goes up to one. This goes down to zero. So our our y is going to be three quarters of the way up. So it's like here. And rad three over four. Um, notice that that would be. That's actually less than a half. Right, because a half would be red two, red uh, red four over four. So red three over four is going to be a little bit less. So here's red three over four. So the point is going to be something like this. And if you were to draw a tangent line there, yeah, I don't know the magnitude, but of course it makes sense that that has negative slope. So the negative red three, the negative kind of convinced me that I'm I'm sort of on the right track. So here the, uh, the slope. Slope of that point is minus right three. And notice I didn't have to convert to x, y to figure that out. And it was easy to check my answers here because I actually know what the graph is. But as you can see, it kind of checks out that the calculus works. Um, so yeah, so, so that's pretty much it. Like when it comes to the calculus of the things, um, polar coordinates isn't going to be that, um, that different. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, with polar coordinates, you need to be on top of your trig. So you need to be able to sketch trig graphs. Like here. And you need to, You need to just know your trig values at special angles. When does the sine function give you zero, et cetera? All right, let's actually continue.
So now uh, we want to do arc length in polar coordinates, which again is going to be based on the formula for arc length in parametric equations. So we saw that the arc length was just the integral of the radical of x prime of t squared plus y prime of t squared. So in polar, it looks like this, x prime of theta squared, y prime of theta squared. And you can actually figure out that that's going to be, um, you can simplify it into this thing in the box. Now, do you need to remember that that's the formula? Probably not. You can actually just derive it on the spot by just using this. Um, it shouldn't be too hard, like when you actually go through the math here. Um, so this is like you're doing, remember your r, your x is r cosine theta squared uh, derivative. So we're going to take the derivative of that and then square it. Plus, we're going to take the derivative of r sine theta and then square that. So this would be uh, differentiate the r, leave the cosine. Differentiate the cosine, leave the r, so it's minus r sine theta all squared. Then here, differentiate the r, leave the sine, plus leave the r, differentiate the sine. So we have that. Now I would just expand the squares, uh, kind of regroup. So this is r prime cosine theta squared minus two r prime r sine theta cosine theta plus r sine theta squared. Plus, so this is going to be the same thing except the middle sign is a plus. So, well, almost the same thing, r prime sine plus two r prime r sine cosine plus r cosine theta squared d theta. So then this would obviously kill that. I have r prime, uh, cosine squared plus r prime sine squared. I can factor out an r prime squared. I'd be left with cosine squared plus psi squared. So that's just an r prime squared. So that is the blue, which is me combining this with that. And then I can combine so I have r sine squared, r squared sine squared, r squared cosine squared, I can factor out the r squared. I'd be left over sine squared plus cosine squared, which gives me one, so I'm left over with r squared. So this is leaving me with r squared. And um, I don't know what color you can do for that. Pink. So that's me I'm simplifying those two. So you have r squared plus dr d theta squared under the radical, and that's what this is. Uh, so that actually simplifies. But once you actually know that formula, now you can actually go and just apply it. Um, so for example, here, find the length of this curve between theta is zero to two pi. So what I would do is first find dr d theta. That's going to be uh, two sine theta. So then I know that the length is going to be the integral from zero to two pi of the radical of r squared. Well, let me write down the formula here. Plus dr d theta 
squared radical d theta. Now I'm just going to plug those guys in. R squared, that's 2 minus 2 cosine theta squared. And then this is 2 sine theta squared. And let's expand this. That's four minus eight cosine theta plus four cosine squared theta plus four sine squared theta d theta. Of course, the last two terms give us four, and then I add that to the other four. So this is just like eight. Because this plus this, that comes together and just makes an eight. So I have an eight minus eight cosine theta and I factored out the eight. So now I have to figure out how to integrate this. It's kind of a weird one. I'm pretty sure I picked an example that can work out. I guess I can use the half angle or double angle formula. So um, this would be 16 times one minus cosine theta over two. So I multiply and divide the inside by two. And that is actually the, um, sine squared theta over two. And of course, um, sine of theta over two, um, sine is always, uh, your theta can go up to a maximum of pi uh, because you know we're going up to two pi. So sine is, the angle here is going from zero to pi because we're dividing by two and your sine function is actually positive on zero pi. So this would actually be square root of 16 is four. It'll be like the absolute value of sine theta over two, but this is actually, um, on this interval, it's always positive. So the absolute value is just like a formality. Um, this actually um, will just actually work out. So then I would integrate this. So it's going to be minus two cosine theta over two between zero and two pi. So it's minus eight cosine plug in two pi, I get pi plus eight cosine zero. Cosine of zero is one, cosine of pi minus one. Right, so that's eight plus eight, which is 16. Okay, yeah, which is the, is the answer, 16. So at this point, um, what we're doing now is just kind of like applications, you can say. Um, we actually covered all the uh, conceptual things that we need for this. Um, now it's just actually applying the formulas that we learned with parametric equations. What else did we have? I'm sure, we had some else.
All right, so I don't know how much of the derivation I want to do here, uh, although it's not much, but um, Air of a sector is a formula that I guess you would know, especially in radians. And so the idea is if we have a polar curve, which is like the pink curve here, you can split it into a bunch of sectors. And uh, each, each of these angles here is going to be some change in theta. And so the, the area you can think of it as just a sum of one half r squared time changes in theta, which approaches an integral because it's a Riemann sum. So it's one half r squared d theta. Right. So that's that's basically what this formula is coming from. Right. You don't need to know how to <laughs> derive it, but essentially you'd have a bunch of Riemann sums. I guess the R's would be different as well. You're indexing by the R's because the radius here, let's say the radius for this one can be R1, but the radius for this one is different. That's your R2. Radius for this one is your R3. So you're dissecting based on the R's and you're chain, you have a change in theta. It's kind of like when, remember we had like the r theta plane so we're dissecting here to get a bunch of delta thetas and then this has a height of r1 and then this has a height of r2 and etc you don't need to know the derivation but you do need to know this formula so once you have that formula you should be good um, another thing that might come up is area between curves and this kind of um, reminds you about Error between functions back in Calc 1, where, you know, if you want the error between two functions, you take the integral of the top function minus the bottom function because it gives you the area under the whole top. Then you subtract the area under the bottom. That leaves you with the area in between them. In a very similar way, if you have two functions of R, you have something that's called, you can think of extending out here as the outer radius. And to get to here is like the inner radius. So this is the outer radius. This is the inner radius. And you essentially find the area in between them by subtraction, just uh, as a similar concept back in Calc 1. So you would get like this formula. So we have this and this. So essentially, I want to do these four examples of error between curves. They kind of give you uh, multiple situations you can find yourself in. And I actually want to wrap up with that. So we might actually end class a little bit early today, which is it's fine. I'd rather you guys uh, start working on the practice test and maybe have some questions for me, which by tomorrow would be the latest. You can ask me questions, I guess, um, for the test. So we'll actually. We'll take a break very soon. But ju again, just to emphasize, I don't want, like the test stuff is from here. So from here upwards, that's test two material. So everything I'm talking about at this point onwards, it's like stuff that you have to worry about for the fine. Like you don't have to worry about this for the test. So, so on one hand, I'm kind of rushing because conceptually, it's like we're just using other stuff and applying it in the new context. Um, but also, you know, you have some time with this as opposed to the other stuff. But uh, we're going to take another five minute break. We're going to do these four problems and then we're going to call it a night. Just the quicker we get through them, the, uh, the quicker you can get back to practicing for your test. And then tomorrow, because we're already past, I, I did mention this last time. Right, so in my mind, like if I covered everything except these three topics, I'd be happy. Um, 
So uh, we've already covered everything except those three topics already. Right now we're dealing with topic 20. And then tomorrow I might talk about 15 and 17. And then Thursday I might continue talking about that. Or and tomorrow I might include just the review for test two. And on Thursday, I might leave some time for you to ask me any questions for the final. Um, but yeah, but for now, we will take a break and then we'll finish up these problems and then we'll move on. So I'll see you guys in a little bit. Yeah, so let's see how we would apply this formula. Well, either this one or that one. So we use this one if there's just one curve, we want the area in under or inside some curve. And we use this one if there's error between two things that we want to figure out. And let's actually just see how these guys are applied. So big R and little r here just refers to the distance from the point we're measuring to the curve that we care about. And that's actually going to be a consistent notation. So we are going to talk about other formulas that have radi radii included in them. And this is going to be a general notation that I'm going to use. So when I use big R, I'm talking about the far measuring the distance of the farther curve, and little r is measuring the distance to the closer curve, and so on. Right? So um, they're abbreviated like this. Let's actually get uh, these out the way. I don't think I copied these, so let's just make some extra spaces. Okay. So here's the first problem. Find the area enclosed by this. Now, the wording of the problem tells me that um, that 0 to 2 pi would likely be what I want to integrate on but you can just kind of uh, do a quick sketch and check. So if we look at, because I know this will never hit the origin. So I kind of know that it's always, it's just gonna be this big blob that's in the middle. So integrating from zero to two pi covers the entire surface. Um, but sometimes you can actually see some stuff by sketching it. But here I, I, I'm gonna show what it would look like. So, so I want you to think of this as optional, optional sketch. Although for more complicated problems, uh, you probably want to sketch it based on the situation because uh, it'd be hard to understand otherwise. Um, but I'll give you some um, uh, tips on that as well. At least how you can get away with sketching just the trig function as opposed to the uh, polar function. So here, uh, if we want, if we want to sketch r equals two plus two cosine theta, so I know how this is going to look. So we're plotting theta versus r. We know that the baseline is at two, and the amplitude is at two. So this is going to go up to four, and it's going to go as low as zero. This is two pi, and two pi over k in this case is going to be two pi. And then we divide that by four. So this is cut into four equal sections. And then we're plotting a cosine. So we know we start here, go to the middle, go to the bottom, go to the middle, go to the top. So this actually does uh, hit the origin, but it, it does it at one point, you never go below it. And so, If you want to do this, there is a circle of radius four and a circle of radius two. And this would be at pi over two, pi, three pi over two. So we start at four when we're at zero. By the time we hit pi over two, we're on the circle of radius two. Then by pi, we hit zero. 
then by the time you hit three pi over two, we're back on the circle of radius two. Then at two pi, we hit four. So it's a cardioid, it's a heart. And we want the area of this, which by the way, you can see that we can have some shortcuts here, um, but I, I don't know if it's gonna actually matter too much. So the area we actually care about is the area enclosed by this thing. Notice that I could go from zero to pi and then double the answer because this is actually going to be symmetric, but you can just do zero to two pi. So you're gonna get the same thing. Um, see? So let's actually go with the formula. So we know that the area is going to be zero to two pi of uh, one half r squared theta, one half r squared d theta. So I'm using the first one because there's no inner curve to worry about. So I'm just using this one. Now our r is two plus two cosine theta. squared. Um, we can use a trick here. We know when you integrate along a full period of a cosine or a sine, the answer is zero because the part on top has the same area as the part on the bottom. So this part is going to be zero, and we can essentially ignore it. As for this part, I'm going to use, we know how to deal with the square. This was back in the section where we looked at how to integrate trick functions. And we looked at when the uh, power of the cosine or the sine were even, we use the double angle formula. So this I'm going to write rewrite as one times one half plus cosine two theta. And so by applying that here, this is equal to the integral from zero to two pi of four plus two times one plus cosine two theta. So that is like six plus two cosine two theta d theta. Now I can integrate these. So this is going to be six theta plus um, sine two theta. So plug in two pi, I would get zero. Um, and this is just the first one then subtract, plugging in zero, I would just get zero plus zero. So this just becomes six pi square units. Is that where we're supposed to get? Yes, six pi. So that is the area enclosed by the polar curve. And we basically use the area of a sector to actually derive that formula using Riemann sums. But in the end, you just need to know the formula. Let's look at the others. Here inside the inner loop of this guy. Well, that's interesting. So what is the inner loop? Now, I would say here there's a recommended sketch because they talk about inner loop. So obviously there's like an inner loop and outer loop. What, what do they mean by that? So, Um, what we can do is sketch this guy. Theater versus R. We know that the middle uh, 
line is going to be one. It's going to go up by two to three, down by two to negative one. Um, that's just sine of theta, so we know it's going to break up like a regular sine function. So this is going to be pi over two pi, three pi over two, two pi. And we're graphing a negative sign. So we start at the middle, then we go to the bottom, go to the middle, go to the top, go to the middle. So that is our function. Now, um, here we are going to need to know what the exact zeros are. And from here, you can kind of see what would happen because how does a loop actually occur? It's like if you start the origin, you go somewhere, you come back to the origin, right? That's a loop. Uh, and you can see when that happens on this graph, right? Being at the origin means you're on the horizontal axis, right? So you can kind of see that the inner loop, the guy we care about would be this one. That is going to be the smaller loop. It makes sense for the smaller loop to be the inner loop. So I was at zero. I went somewhere, came back to zero. And obviously the big loop would be like this guy, right? Which if I shifted this part over here, that will give you the bigger loop because you know how angles work, it'll just be repeating. So here I know that I can just integrate this function between these two points and that will give it to me. But I, I can show you from the other graph if, if this part is confusing. But here we need to know the zeros, the intercepts. So we need to know where one minus two sine theta is equal to zero. So this would mean sine theta equals one half. This would mean that theta equals, we know that sine of pi over six is a half. So pi over six is going to be one of them. And five pi over six is going to be the other one because of all CNC tape calculus. Um, so pi over six is the one in the first quadrant five pi over six is going to be our reference angle in the second quadrant. So those are these two values. So, so you're going to want to integrate between those two values, but just in case that's not obvious, um, here I would say this is an optional sketch. Uh, draw a circle of radius three. Circle of radius one. Here in the, here we're in the x y plane, and now we can actually start plotting. When the angle is zero, we're on the circle of radius one. Then uh, we also need these angles. So there is a pi over six and a five pi over six. So from that, I go to pi over six where I hit zero. Then at pi over two, which is in this direction, I go below and go with a negative one. So that means I go to the opposite direction on the circle of radius one. I would come back and at that point I'm at five pi over six. Then when I'm at pi, I'm on the circle of radius one. At three pi over two, I'm on the circle of radius three. And at uh, two pi, I'm back on the circle of radius one. So notice I just created something with an inner loop. You can also notice that the inner loop occurred when I was between these two angles. So those two angles correspond to the area that's in the inner loop. If I wanted the area of any, everything except the inner loop, I would actually integrate the other way. Um, but here, if I go between pi over six and five pi over six, that was underneath. But that is something you could actually get from looking at this graph. So you didn't have to do this sketch. This sketch kind of shows you, well, if it's the inner loop, it has to be the smaller loop. And I know a loop means I was at the horizontal, I went somewhere and came back to the horizontal, that creates a loop. 
And so I can know that these are the things I want to integrate between just from this sketch and uh, solving for the zeros. Either way, uh, we get that here. The area is just going to be the integral from pi over six to five pi over six of, I always forget to put the alpha side, one half r squared d theta. In this case, our r is one minus two sine theta. And at this point, you're just doing integration, which we spent a long time on that. So this is going to be one minus four sine theta plus four sine squared theta d theta. We know that this is gonna go off to zero. This I can treat as one half one minus cosine two theta. And so this would become one half times the integral of pi over six five pi over six, uh, that would be two. So this will end up being a three. And then that uh, I would have minus two cosine two theta d theta. So this is going to be one half. Actually, I think I can actually integrate these at this point. It's three theta um, minus sine two theta between pi over six and five pi over six. So plug in five pi over six. This is giving me five pi over three minus plug in pi over six minus minus a minus so this would just be pi over three so this would be five pi over two five pi over three is in the fourth quadrant because right, pi over three means you take pi, you divide into three sections, take five sections, one, two, three, four, five, puts you in the fourth quadrant. All students take calculus, so we know that the sine would give us a negative value in that quadrant, but it'll give you the same magnitude as sine of pi over three, which we know is radical three over two. Minus here, I have pi over two, plus sine of pi over three is rad three over two. So here I would have one half times five power two minus power over two is four power over two. So that's just two pi. And then I would have rad three over two plus rad three over two. That's just actually plus rad three. So this is pi plus rad three over two would be the area. So that would be our integral. Um, I did make a mistake here. What is this? So it should be a negative three rad three over two. What, what am I? Did I mix up a sign somewhere? S-I-G-N. <laughs> it's gonna be a two, which gives us a three. So that three is okay. Um, 
Then if I multiply that out, I would get a minus two cosine two theta. The integral of that is minus sine two theta. So I think this is fine. Maybe I was plugging in wrong. So I plug in five power over six. The two cancels, that makes three. And then minus, I plug in pi over six. That becomes a plus. And so I get sine of sine of pi over three is rad three over two. Wait, did I is this three rad three over two? So maybe I I actually subtracted something. You guys see where I made the error? I don't see where I made that error. Maybe I'll look at it later. Let's move on to the other one. It's very strange. So I got the pi part, but the three rad three over two. Oh, yes, uh, here. That's not zero because we didn't, ugh. we weren't going over a full period. Yeah, I just, I got in the habit of the last one. So there's another part to this. I just got happy to be canceling stuff, but there is another part to this, like that four sine theta won't go to zero because I'm not on the full period. I am on pi over six to five pi over six. So that is actually going to still be relevant. I integrate the sine, I'm going to get a plus four cosine. Why did no one catch me? Why are you all alone out here? Okay, so this is going to put in So there is actually going to be a plus four cosine five pi over six. And then there's also going to be a minus or cosine pi over six. Okay, so let's actually redo that. Let's 
So that is five pi over two. Five pi over six is in the second quadrant. Cosine of pi over six is rad three over two. So it's going to be two rad three. This we already saw was minus rad three over two. Minus, this was pi over two. Minus, All students think this should be a minus. So this is here. This is actually also a minus two rad three. And then sine of pi over three is rad three over two. All right, so this here, five pi over two, this is two pi. Then I would have um, minus four rad three plus rad three. So I'd have three rad three, minus three rad three. That's the, so that was correct. So I also have this one here, find the area inside one leaf. Um, you know, things like this with the cosine, it's going to look like the polar graph is going to look like something like this, and then that, and then that. This is actually super similar to, I think I gave you something like this earlier. Like B, that was with uh, two cosine three. That actually looks like that. But with three cosine three, you just extend it to be three units away from the origin instead of two. So the lengths of the petals will be three instead of two, but it's going to be essentially the same. Now we don't need to know that graph, uh, although it's, it'll be useful um, if you don't see how to use it from the other graph. But one thing that is useful is just the regular trig graph. So I would say, it's recommended that you sketch the regular trig graph. Just r equals three cosine three theta. And you kind of know that this just means the cosine is going to be repeated three times between zero and two pi. And it has an amplitude of three to minus three. So if this is two pi, there's going to be three sections. Each of those sections would have four parts. Um, we did earlier calculations to know that this would happen at pi over six, uh, two pi over six, three pi over six, four pi over six, five pi over six, six pi over six, seven pi over six, eight pi over six, uh, nine pi over six, 10 pi over six, 11 pi over six, and 12 pi over six, which is two pi. And we know that these are just cosine graphs. So cosine is gonna start from the top, the middle, the bottom, middle, top, middle, bottom, middle, top, middle, bottom, middle, top. So now that that, and by the way, I can know that um, any one of these guys where I make a loop 
I can do a leaf. So I can say it's like this. I can do double that area, just integrate from zero to two pi, because a full leaf would be this. And this is like a half. So this here. So this here. Area of full leaf. But that is going from theta goes from pi over six all the way up to two pi over two. Um, this though is the area of half a leaf. So I can just apply my formula and double it. So what I'm going to do is this implies the area is going to be double the one half, the integral from zero to pi over six of r squared d theta, where that double comes from the, the fact that I'm basing my interval on half of a leaf which I can just see from this graph. So you, you see that you don't even really need the second trig graph just by how the actual polar curve, just by how the question is phrased. I know I want the air inside of one leaf. Looking at this picture is obviously how we get the leaves. It's when we loop away from the origin and come back. And so here our R is three cosine three theta. So this is just going to be the integral from zero to pi over six of nine cosine squared three theta. So now cosine squared, we're going to do the half angle formula. So that's nine over two. So this is one plus cosine six theta because you double the angle. And so now we integrate that theta. This would be one six sine six theta between zero to pi over six. By the way, this is going to this is going to go to zero whether I plug in pi over six. So the sixes would cancel. I would get sine of pi, which is zero. If I plug in zero for theta, sine of zero is zero. So really, it's just the other guy. So it's just nine over two times pi over six, which three goes into six. So it's, is that like three pi over four? Yes, three pi over four. So we're making good time here. I mean, I haven't keeping track of time exactly, but sub 10 minutes, we can do one of these. And that's if you're, you, you try to want to do everything, which I don't always ask you to do everything. And oh, this isn't going to be like on the test either anyway, so. Technically, we don't have to worry about this just yet. <laughs> can, can delay worrying about this until next week. Um, here's an interesting one. Uh, we want to find the area inside this, but outside that. And uh, this one, is that the same one we sketched before? Yeah, two plus two cosine, we actually sketched that before. So uh, to illustrate what we want to illustrate. Now this one, you'd probably have to graph. Um, we saw this before. That one of them looked like you know, there was a circle of radius two 
it was a circle of radius four. Now R equals three is just a circle of radius three. So there's one graph that looks like, you know, this. As for the other graph, we graphed it earlier. It looked like uh, this. Right. So it says we wanted inside this heart, but outside this. So the error we care about is this one right here. Right, so sketching is recommended here. I mean, for you to actually figure that out. If there are like two things they're asking about, then I would say don't try to like shortchange things, like sketch it out. Usually one of them would be very easy to sketch, at least for what I would ask you. Like one would just be a circle and the other one would be something that you have to like go through the motions of the sketching the polar curves to figure out. Um, so essentially this comes down to, I need to figure out what angle gives me these intersections. Because between that, I'm actually going to be uh, covering this green region. Um, and so how would you figure that out? Well, it's an intersection. So you actually try to figure out when is one curve equal to the other one. So for intersections, I am going to set two plus two cosine theta. equals three. So set the r's equal to each other. Um, you will notice that that means two cosine theta is equal to one. So this means your cosine theta is equal to one half. So we know that the first one is going to be pi over three. And the next one is going to be, you can see it here, minus pi over three. I mean, it's gonna be the reference angle for that in the other one. Now I wrote it as minus pi over three as opposed to five pi over three, because I want to increase in this way, um, increasing angle. Like if I wrote five pi over three to like pi over three, it would be going around this way, which I don't want. So, um, yeah, so here, this is one with the, the two curves. So my area is going to be one half times the integral from minus pi over three to pi over three times big R squared minus little r squared. Where here, the um, extending to here is little r, and extending to out there is your big R. Extending out here is your big R. Okay, so the big R is actually the, uh, the cosine graph. So I wanted inside this one, which means that is the outer edge but outside the R equals three. So R equals three is the inner edge. So this here is your big R. This here is your little R. And so now I'm just going to plug those in. So this is one half. And by the way, I can double this and just go from zero because it's symmetric. by doing two times this area, which let me do some alternate shading here. So I'm doing double that area instead of just doing, because plugging in minus power three is gonna be annoying. I'd rather plug in zero. So here we'd have 
2 plus 2 cosine theta all squared minus 3 squared. This is 4 plus 8 cosine theta. Not going to make that mistake again. Because this is not going to go to 0 automatically because we're not on a full period. We're only between 0 and pi over 3 plus 4 cosine squared theta minus 9. So here, let's see, we have uh, 8 cosine theta. We would have plus 2 times 1 plus cosine 2 theta. And then the 4 minus 9 is going to be minus 5. So we're going to have that 2. This is plus two cosine two theta minus three d theta. So now I can integrate this. This is just going to be eight sine theta. This is going to be sine two theta. It's going to be minus three theta between zero and pi over three. Now, luckily, when we plug in zeros, all of these guys are going to go to zero, sine of zero, zero, and three times zero is zero. So I just worry about plugging in the pi over three. This is going to be eight sine pi over three plus sine of two pi over three minus three pi over three. So sine of pi over three is rad three over two. So this is four rad three. 2 pi over 3 is in the second quadrant. Sine is positive there. So this is another rad 3 over 2. And then here we just have pi. So this should be 9 rad 3 over 2 minus pi. Because 4 I can think of as 8 over 2 plus 1 over 2. Uh, let's see here. Is that right? 9 rad 3 over 2 minus pi. Yep. So that's that one. So we are, um, we'll wrap up right there tonight. Um, not too much earlier, about a little bit, about 10 minutes earlier. Um, like I said, you can worry about this like afterwards. Just want to show you how to apply those formulas. But what you really need to know is uh, this point and above up until series, right? So everything to do with series, parametric equations, and sketching polar curves and hyperbolas and ellipses. That's what's covered by test two. I, 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 think, I think that's everything. Anyway, there is a practice test. Yeah. Arc length also, that, that is in, involved in parametric equations. Um, so calculus of, Parametric equations and calculus with parametric equations, arc length is included in that, I guess, because it's an integral formula. Um, everything to do with series, including Taylor and Maclaurin series and their applications. And yeah, polar coordinates up until the sketching of polar coordinates, not the calculus of polar coordinates. Um, so from the calculus of polar coordinates onwards, like it's not on the test. Um, any questions before we go? Okay. So that will be all for now, I suppose. I will bid you guys a good night. Good luck on studying for the test. Um, try to do the practice exam by tomorrow. Maybe ask me some questions tomorrow. I'll put aside some time. Um, could be questions from the practice test or some of the homework problems that you've been working on that are relevant. And yeah, we'll uh, actually wrap up there. So have a good night and I will see you guys in the next one. Ciao.